kids, do you have a spooky story to tell? If so, we'd love to hear it, fact or fiction. Send your story to microterrors at gmail.com to have it narrated on the Micro Terrors podcast, posted on microterrors.com, and published in a future Micro Terrors anthology book. Visit microterrors.com and click on the Listener Terrors tab for more information and to submit your scary story. Welcome to Micro Terrors. Scary Stories for Kids where it's always the spooky season, full of chills, thrills, and spine-tingling spooks. Micro-terrors are family-friendly frights for those ages 8 and up. And while our stories are for younger ears, we are still talking about things that go bump in the night and some children may not be able to handle what others can. Parental consent is recommended. Now, for tonight's Micro Terror. The Grove City Werewolf, Part 2, written by Scott Donnelly. Sean awoke the next morning, having surprisingly slept soundly all night long. His first thoughts were of Tammy's Pizza, could that pizza have been so good that I forgot all of my troubles, he thought, as he rolled out of bed. He looked around the room he was in. It felt strange to him. It wasn't his room. It was a spare bedroom at his aunt and uncle's house in Grove City. The more he thought about it, he didn't even have a room anymore. His old one didn't count, since his parents were in North Carolina signing the final paperwork on a new house. That's why he was forced to spend the weekend with extended family that he didn't know very well. Sean heard the muffled voices of his Uncle Curtis and Aunt Jade down the hallway. He went to the door and put an ear to it, but still couldn't make out much of what they were saying, so he cracked the door open about an inch. That was enough to catch the last moments of their conversation down the hall. "'It's never attacked anyone before. Don't you find this concerning?' Jade quietly said. There was silence from Curtis for a moment, but then he responded, I can't believe this is actually happening. A monster in Grove City! Curtis let out a quick, nervous laugh. <laughs> Who would have ever thought, huh? That poor man, Jade said. I know, Curtis responded, and I planned on taking Sean to Skylarks today. Guess that won't be happening. Uncle Curtis and Aunt Jade went silent after that so Sean emerged from his room and crept down the hallway. The floorboards creaking beneath his feet gave him away, though. As he turned the corner into the living room, he saw his aunt and uncle sitting around the TV drinking coffee. On the TV was a news reporter standing in front of a local Grove City business. At the bottom of the screen were the words, Grove City Business Owner Attacked by Local Legend, Police Baffled. Uncle Curtis was quick to turn off the TV as soon as Sean made his creaky entrance into the room. Aunt Jade stood up and put on a forced, fake smile. Good morning, Sean. Did you sleep okay? Yeah, Sean coldly replied. He'd quickly grown tired of his aunt and uncle's secrecy and whatever it was that had been going on in Grove City. A curfew? A monster? Sean wanted answers. After breakfast and a shower, Sean followed Uncle Curtis out the front door and was immediately stung by the brisk temperatures of the late morning hours. "'I was going to show you the comic book store today, but...' Curtis searched for the right words. "'They're closed.' Sean rolled his eyes. Did his uncle really think he was that stupid? He saw the TV screen. He heard his and Aunt Jade's hushed conversation. "'Instead, I'll take you back down to Broadway.' Curtis said, jingling the car keys in his hand. The library is amazing. We could get some ice cream at Strasser's afterwards. Oh, and the Grove City Visitor Center. That's where we should start. There's so much local flair in there, you'll really see what this town is all about. Oh, you mean aside from monsters and secrets? 
Sean thought to himself. He just nodded along as his uncle unlocked the car. "'Morning, neighbor!' a man's voice shouted from behind them. Sean turned around, just as Curtis did. They saw Reese, the young twenty-something next door, raking his yard. "'Morning, Reese!' Curtis smiled and waved. "'I see you got some company there, Curtis!' Reese said, taking a break from his autumn chore. Bongo lay in the leaves nearby with his head up, alert, as dogs always were. "'This is my nephew, Sean. He's staying with us for the weekend.' Reese waved again. "'Hi, Sean. I'm Reese. Nice to meet you.' Sean nodded shyly. "'You too. I like your dog.' Reese laughed. "'Oh, Bongo here? Yeah, he's a good boy. Very loyal. That's the best quality of a dog.' Reese then turned his attention back to Curtis and changed the subject. "'You know, I could still use a little help in the attic, Curtis. Think you'd have an hour or so to spend this weekend?' Sean watched his uncle panic and scramble for an excuse. Uh, uh, maybe I I'll let you know. I'm taking Sean around today. Not sure what tomorrow's gonna bring. Reese nodded. He wasn't stupid. He knew Curtis was trying to avoid helping. It wasn't very neighborly. Well, you guys have a good day, Reese said. You too, Reese, Curtis said as he climbed into the car. Sean got in too, and then they drove off. The Grove City Visitor Center on Broadway was smaller than Sean expected. When his uncle said, Visitor Center, his young mind immediately went to the finale of Jurassic Park. But this place was more like a gift shop. A woman on the shorter side, wearing a sports jacket and a friendly smile, greeted Sean and Curtis when they entered. Welcome, she said in a sweet voice. What brings you guys in today? Curtis put his hand on Sean's back. My nephew is from out of town. I'm just showing him what Grove City is all about, and I figured this would be a good place to start. Absolutely. I'm Teresa Breckenridge, she said with a smile, shaking Sean's hand and then Curtis's. She looked down at Sean. Grove City has been named the best hometown in Ohio two years in a row now, so you're definitely in the presence of comfort, hospitality, and monsters. Sean impulsively said out loud, although he initially intended for it to be an inner thought. The two adults went quiet and just looked at each other. We'll just uh, look around, Curtis finally said. Teresa nodded, unsure as to how to continue the conversation. Let me know if you have any questions. Curtis began to show Sean around the store, completely ignoring the monster comment he had just blurted out. They looked at Grove City t-shirts homemade gifts, books by independent authors who lived nearby, and local baked goods. It gave Sean an idea of the tight-knit community that Grove City was. By the pictures on the wall and the books and pamphlets scattered about the store, it looked like it was a town rich in history. He also saw a blue and white sign proudly displayed that read, Grove City, Best Hometown 2023 and 2024 by Ohio Magazine. Curtis's cell phone rang and he looked at the screen. It's your Aunt Jade, he said. Give me a minute, Sean. Curtis answered the phone and stepped away, speaking softly as to not disrupt the quiet atmosphere of the store, even though there was no one else in there. Teresa walked up to Sean with her hands in the pockets of her sports jacket. Monster, huh? she said. Sean turned and faced her. Finally, he thought, someone actually acknowledged the elephant in the room. Yeah, Sean said softly so his uncle wouldn't hear him. What is going on in this town? There's a curfew? Weird secrets? Something about a monster attack last night? What's it all about? Teresa smiled and then whispered, Don't tell your uncle I said anything, she said. He clearly doesn't want you to worry, but there have been some weird sightings around town lately. People say they've seen a giant wolf standing upright on two legs. A wolf standing on two legs? Sean whispered back. You mean, are you talking about a werewolf? Teresa nodded. There have been stories of werewolves in Ohio for a long time, and it's always been speculated that we had some here in the area, but lately that speculation became more of a truth. People have seen it in every part of town. Something seems to have stirred it up, rustled it out of hiding, and now last night it attacked that poor Skylark guy. 
it never attacked anyone before. That would explain the secrecy and curfew, Sean said. Why won't my uncle just tell me all that then? He's just trying to keep you safe, to keep you from worrying, Teresa said. She took a deep breath. We just hope it doesn't get worse. We have no idea why the sightings and activity have escalated so much lately. A werewolf is a predator, Sean said, probably top of the food chain. What would have it all riled up? Teresa shrugged, leaving the haunting answer to the question lingering in the air. Once Curtis was finished with his phone call, he and Sean left the visitor center. They grabbed ice cream across the street at Strasser's Ice Cream Pop and Candy Shop and then drove around town as Curtis pointed out places he found interesting or worth showing off. But Sean wasn't paying much attention to any of it. He was focused on what Teresa Breckenridge had told him. Grove City had a werewolf, and for some reason that werewolf had been triggered and turned into an aggressive, dangerous threat. The day came to an end, and once the sun set, the curfew took effect. Storefronts displayed their closed-for-curfew signs. Shoppers scrambled for their last-second purchases, and a heavier police presence patrolled the streets. Teresa Breckenridge walked out of the visitor center and closed the door. After arming the security system, she made sure the door was locked. She pulled her coat tightly around her body and slung her purse over her shoulder. Broadway was silent. A cold breeze flowed down the street. Dead leaves scratched across the road. The festival fall flags on the light poles fluttered gently. Teresa felt a chill of unease. Something made a noise behind her and she spun around. There was nothing. No one on the sidewalk in either direction. A police car turned off of Broadway and onto Park Street only a block away. Other than that, there wasn't another car in sight. Hello? She called out, knowing that she heard something. Then a howl erupted in the night, and it was close. Teresa's heart dropped. She turned and ran, cutting down the narrow alley between businesses. Suddenly the howl ripped through the cold night air again. Teresa stopped at the end of the alley by a public parking lot. She looked up. Perched upon the top of the building, with the full moon at its back, was the werewolf. It stood on its hind legs, arched its back, and howled again. Then it crouched, locked its hungry eyes on Teresa, and pounced. <laughs> Tune in next week for Part 3 of the Microterrorist four-week Halloween event, The Grove City Werewolf. Thank you for listening to Micro Terrors. Join us each Saturday for another scary story. For more fun, Visit our website at microterrors.com, where you can get the latest Micro Terrors news, read fun facts about each story, sign up for our monthly newsletter, and even send in your own scary story for us to tell. Plus, you can become one of the terrified by joining the fan club at microterrors.com to enjoy exclusive perks like reading stories a week early receiving complimentary books, and communicating directly with Micro Terrors writer and creator Scott Donnelly. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram using the handle at Micro Terrors. I hope you'll join us again soon for Micro Terrors, scary stories for kids. Hey, mystery seekers, love spooky stories? Dive in to Creepy Clubhouse. Each month, you'll receive a box packed with books and gifts right to your doorstep, featuring a new spooky or mysterious theme every month. From aliens to Bigfoot to the Bermuda Triangle, perfect for young listeners like you who crave thrilling adventures. Exclusive from Micro Terrors listeners, use promo code TERROR10 to get 10% off your first box. Visit creepyclubhouse.com and then use TERROR10 as your promo code and start your spooky journey today. Join the club. Embrace the creepy.